Hello everyone out there in Facebook. This is Susan Gerbink. I'm in conversation with Leonard Trammell, a very good friend of mine going way back to the old, to the old days when we used to ride dinosaurs and on the way to school and back. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, um, we are live uh, on Facebook and we will be uploading this to YouTube. I must mention that we are, uh, this is part of the About Time Project, which is a uh, nonprofit 501c, 3, 3C uh, nonprofit. 501c3. 501c3. Leonard is going to correct me. That's fine. He's just, that's the kind of guy he is. I love him. That's me. <laughs> but anyway, so we are a nonprofit. We ask that um, um, you please subscribe to us on Facebook under About Time Project, as well as on YouTube. We love to have 100 subscribers. That's my goal is to get up to 100 subscribers because new bells and whistles happen whenever we have uh, 100 subscribers. Can you believe I can't get 100 subscribers to my YouTube channel? It's insane, but everybody's watching on Facebook. <clears throat> yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. It's hard to, I know, I know, hard I to know. make a dent. Well, anyway, so here's on Facebook. <clears throat> yeah, but we're critical thinkers and we have amazing talks. The people I talk to are all so interesting. We well, talk about at, some at least most of them. <laughs> so um, on Facebook, you guys, I have a, a screen off to my, my right where I'm able to see the chat that goes on. And Rob Palmer says that this better be good. No pressure or anything, Leonard. And uh, <laughs> So I can see your comments. I can only see maybe the last five comments that you have. So if there's something you really want to make sure that I that I get in and talk to Leonard about, make sure you ask more than once if if I have if too much time has passed by. But anyway, so I'm gonna let Leonard introduce himself and I'll probably tell some nice fun stories about Leonard. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, so uh, I'm Leonard Trammell. And uh, as Susan said, we've known each other for uh, many years, not quite dating back to dinosaurs, but uh, in some ways close. Uh, I've had a very interesting and strange life, but um, I'm a scientist by training and a, uh, a pedant by inclination. So as Susan mentioned, I'm just the kind of guy who correct her when she says just about anything. Um, if it's wrong, of course, only if it's wrong. but that's okay. Um, I've been interested in science <clears throat> uh, since the third grade. I, my hobby's been astronomy. Got me interested in physics and astrophysics, got a PhD in astrophysics. And then as, a, uh, as life took its rather strange um, turns and twists, I wound up as uh, vice president of software for Atari, uh, which was quite a quite a change from being a graduate student in physics. Uh, I retired uh, about a dozen years later. Uh, that was in the mid nineties. And I've been working on science popularization, science literacy, uh, joined the board of the Center for Inquiry and have been doing this skeptic stuff um, <laughs> for uh, a good 20 years. And he's talking to us from his basement. And I, and I am talking to you from my basement. Uh, occasionally, awesome. my wife lets me get above ground, uh, but uh, not now. He straightened up for us, too, you guys. It's oh, no. You, you don't want me to see what happens <laughs> if I turn here. the camera slightly photos. that way. Um, I have photos, you guys. This, is, this place is yeah, fascinating. It's, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. The, uh, the pile of uh, uh, detritus on my desk is about two feet high. Yeah. But he says he knows where everything is. And, and I demonstrated for her. It's true. Uh, well, I wouldn't say everything, honestly, just most. So Leonard lives about an hour and a half from me. He's north. He's up. Uh, I'm in Salinas. And we're, we're, you know, on the same highway almost, you know. So. Yep. Both, uh, both pretty close to Highway 101. So whenever I'm going to drive up that area for some reason, you know, maybe I'll say, hey, I have to be in that area to pick somebody up at the airport or I have an appointment up there. Who wants to have lunch? And then we can maybe go have lunch or something. It's yeah, that's always very fun. Convenient. Very convenient. We haven't done that in a while. I wonder uh, yeah, why. I don't know what's been going on. You know, I hear people have been really shunning me lately. I haven't. Been able to hang out so there's something in the way. Something in the air. <laughs> 
uh, suspended in small water droplets. <laughs> Leonard came and he had, uh, we had lunch together. Wow, it's been a couple of years. Whenever you were getting your ID, your, your photo ID, and the nearest place DMV that had an appointment for you was in Salinas, and you came down to Salinas. Yeah, it was actually uh, quicker for me to get uh, a DMV appointment in Salinas um, than, and drive back and forth than to <laughs> wait uh, for the uh, uh, unscheduled appointments uh, nearby. Yeah. And I got to have lunch with Susan. So. Yeah, isn't that great? She got, you get to have lunch with me in downtown Salinas. And downtown Salinas, actually, it was great. I mean, you know, we have great weather. Everybody should come out to Salinas and visit after we are have the all clear that everything is fine <laughs> come on out uh, whenever Weather that will incredible. be it's a great i know i i this i'm more and more afraid that the mo normal that we have right now which feels pretty weird and awful is going we're going to look back and go oh my gosh i wish we were back in august of 2020 Oh, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but I, um, uh, but I don't think it's going to be the normal we were used to. I looked at that spike. I've, I've seen the spike of that 1918 flu and 1919 and how it was like this huge spike and then went normal. Then, ah! Yeah. <laughs> um, so frightening. That yeah, is so I don't, frightening. I don't think that's going to happen. Says Leonard, and he's very smart. So now I feel a little more. Well, no, I, right I, I, there, there is no expertise. In, well, what about uh, psychics? In this. Uh, there can is no ask? expertise. Can we ask? Can we know <laughs> what's going on with psychics? We can, we can ask, uh, but asking isn't always knowing. Yeah, well, you know, unfortunately, there's no track record for them. So you are, you are, you are at, um, the you've got involved with the center for inquiry can you yep. tell everybody what that is who may not know what that is and how you got involved with them yeah so um my involvement happened in a fairly routine way uh somewhere along the line i saw a copy of skeptical inquire magazine and uh, bought it and read it and subscribed to it that was back in the 1980s Oh, um, I thought it was longer ago. I thought you were in the Well, the, uh, the magazine hasn't been around much longer than that. Uh, hmm. CFI started in 76. or Well, C, PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, uh, which thankfully changed its name to something shorter. Unfortunately, the uh, choice was made to sound like a TV show, CSI, we had um, first. Yeah. And it <laughs> doesn't um, work though. <laughs> it, that, that, that does not work. Um, so, as things got online, I was uh, paying more attention to what was happening. And there was a local meeting uh, to try to set up a local chapter of, uh, of CFI uh, around the, the turn of the last millennium. And uh, I had a chance to meet the, the founder, uh, Paul Kurtz, which was pretty darn cool. Uh, so I went up and did that and uh, got, got more involved, uh, went to the Skeptics Toolbox up in Eugene, Oregon, which was a fantastic uh, experience. Did that uh, for several years. And um, one day at the, at the Toolbox, uh, Barry Carr, the executive director of the, uh, the skeptics branch of uh, CFI, uh, CSI, asked me if I would uh, be willing to serve on the board. Uh, and I said, are you sure you're not confusing me with someone you actually want to be on the board? And he, uh, he said, no, I, we, we mean you. And uh, I've been on the board ever since. We can talk about Barry Carr for an hour or two. I don't think he's listening. Uh, well, that wouldn't be fair then, would it? But that shouldn't recording. stop us. We're recording. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't stop us. We'll see if all of a sudden I get a text message in the next 30 seconds. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? I am listening. Stop. He was listening yesterday, so I don't know if he's listening today. Now, let's, um, you know, it's funny because that was my involvement too, is I had found a Skeptical Inquirer magazine right. at 
wonder if it was at a library. I can't remember. Remember those? And um, the cover was just grabbed me, you know, the, the, um, the cover, whatever it was, something on their vampires or something. I've tried looking for the issue and it must have been in the late 80s. So and before or after it went from small I think it was pamphlet big. to big. Okay. I think this, it was big. Yeah. So I, I, I yeah. I had the smaller one. I think it was the late 80s, right? I have I have yeah. all issues right now, so I could probably look, but I I've tried to find the issue that got me interested. And I think what I was the story I tell is I is I went through it looking at the topics, I was like saying to myself, oh this is crazy. People believe this, this nonsense. This is just, wait, wait, this stuff. Wait, that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> it was like some of the stuff attracted me to read it. Yep. And some of this stuff you're like, wait a minute. I hadn't, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. I certainly had no idea about chiropractic. Um, I, I was actually, I had both of my kids by the time I was still going to a chiropractor. It was a lot later when I found out about chiroprac chiropractors. Um, what was your, um, oh, and then the same thing. There was a local meeting in San Jose. It was 2000 and 2000, it was 2000 when I said, um, Skeptical Inquirer mailed me this flyer saying that they're gonna do this thing up in the Bay Area. I don't think Paul Kurtz was there. And I went to that and I met Carol and Ben Baumgartner. Uh -huh. And I was trying, I had just enrolled in college. I was a late bloomer. I mean, I'd had my, I had my AA, I had two AAs and they had opened Monterey, uh, University of Monterey, California State, University, California State University, University of Monterey, Monterey Bay. Yeah, Bay. they just opened it because we have a, <clears throat> a, 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 a army base here, Fort Ord, and it had converted, they'd closed it. So it became a university. And I said, um, I can go get my BA because I was working full time and I had children and a house and all these other things. So I couldn't really go anywhere in any place farther away to get my BA. And I said, I'm going to go and get my BA. And then when I was there, I was in social and behavioral sciences. I was really trying to find what I would write my thesis on. And it was science illiteracy. And I was cool. really interested in that because of the, the, some of the things I'd read in the Skeptical Inquirer. I think they just come out with a, I think it was a Pew poll that they do every every year talking about science and literacy. Does that sound? Uh -huh. Sounds about right. And they ask, you know, does the sun go around the moon? I mean, earth or the earth go around the sun and right. are viruses, you know, by bacteria, killed by bacteria and like, um, do we and evolve from dinosaurs or are <laughs> we <Right. laughs> around at the same time? Anyway, they ask the same standard questions pretty much every year and that right. way they can judge uh, science literacy or science illiteracy or, or lack thereof. Yeah. And that was my, that was my research and that's how I got more involved. And then I went to the skeptic toolbox because Carol and Ben were like, you have to go to the toolbox. And that was my first one, I think in 2000. And that was a blast to me. Can you explain what the toolbox is? Who are the people and what is that all about? And so the Skeptics Toolbox um, is the brainchild of uh, Ray Hyman, uh, who was one of the founders of uh, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And it's a, a weekend, uh, a very intense and intensive uh, weekend. You, we all met on the campus of the University of, of Oregon in, uh, in Eugene and um, amazing uh, faculty uh, teaching it. And each of them would talk about something in their area of expertise and explain what it is about uh, the way the mind works that makes us come to wrong conclusions and confuses us and how we distort information, uh, not just because we're some small group that doesn't quite get it right, but everyone does this. And that's one of the things that uh, I found particularly important uh, in the toolbox was the emphasis on these are normal, inevitable side effects of being human. 
and everyone needs to watch out for it. Uh, and they uh, break into uh, uh, we, we break into groups to do a presentation at the end of the last day, uh, and it's it's remarkable how much stuff uh, got done in in those two days, and and the creativity and uh, intelligence of all of the people uh, participating was just just wonderful, uh, and lots of time in between sessions for socializing, uh, you know, have lunch, dinner together, uh, lots of lots of fun stuff. Uh, yeah, I miss the Skeptics Toolbox. I, I miss it badly. The, um, you know, Leonard's talking about how, well, when my first one I went, the, the topic was speaking to the dead. So maybe that's what, I think that's partially why psychics are my, are my thing, because Ray Hyman had such, because a lot of time they have some kind of theme, yeah. And um, so we so we went and we learned, uh, we had to evaluate case studies. We we looked at research that um, Gary Schwartz had done. So I, I learned about Gary Schwartz right off the bat, read his, read his, um, his uh, I think he tried to put an article to, to one of those uh, prestige, prestigious journals. I think it actually got published, JAMA or something. I can't remember now, but we learned about Clever Hans. I'd never heard of these concepts. And there was, I think there'd be about 50 to 70 people. It was about average to attend. Yeah, something like that. Uh, a lot the of numbers people varied people pretty people widely. Come all the time. And it was up at the University of Eugene. Right. In Oregon. Yep. I was watching. And um, the faculty almost never changed. It was the same faculty. It was Harriet Hall. No, 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 wait. Ah. Yeah, Harriet, Harriet came in later. Yeah. So it was um, uh, James Alcott, right. Lauren Pancras. Barry Beierstein, Wally Sampson, um, uh, Ray Hyman. Yeah, and some other magician that lived in the area, Jerry Andrus. Oh, Jerry Andrus, yes, of course. And, um, but Jerry Andrus didn't lecture when I was there. He was around, but he didn't lecture. And right. so I wrote the Wikipedia page, you guys, and I put it in the show notes so that you guys can look at show notes, the comment section for the Facebook page. And, um, then Harriet Hall uh, started attending the same time I attended, and she was an attendee, and I was an attendee, attendee, and we were nobody, nobody ever heard of us or anything, and and that was where she got her start, and that's basically where I got my start, and it was pretty funny to kind of grow up in the skeptic movement with Harriet Hall at the same time. Well, one of the great things about the toolbox is the uh, the faculty would would eat meals with us. Yes. And you had tons of downtime because you're stuck in this area. You know, you're yeah. sleeping at the college. Yeah, you're, but it, it was, it was great eat at the college. You just go into the you go in, put your pass in. And the, I think it was like two hour breakfast, two hour lunch, two hour dinner, something right. like that. And you would go and you put your pass into the cafeteria. And then there would have these huge tables all over. Right. And you would just you come in, to the table sit, and you know, sit down next to Ray Hyman. For two hours and talk, right. and, and it was it was incredible because you were with fifty people or so, and you get right. to know them because you don't have any other choice. It's like when we'd go on a cruise ship and there's no internet, <laughs> there's all this downtime, so everybody would gravitate to this area in a cafeteria kind of setting and just hang out, and then you know you're watching the water go by and. And you're talking to each other because you can't be on your phones, you can't be fiddling with your laptop. I mean, you could, but why you know and yeah, it, the first time i went to the toolbox was long enough ago that fiddling on the phone was was not a thing that people did <laughs> yeah yeah it, it was great we had not evolved to that point yet <laughs> the dinosaurs didn't have usb ports back then but um it, it it morphed okay so i'm looking at the wikipedia page i wrote and the first skeptic toolbox was in 1989 and it was held in Buffalo, New York. Uh -huh. and then they went to Eugene, Oregon in 92. Right. And then they tried to do it over in Boulder, Colorado in 94. And then in 95, it started consistently being at the uh, University of Eugene. And it went until 2015 as the last one. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember when I started going. Let's um, but it was, it was the first year 
that Barry Beierstein didn't, what wasn't part of the faculty, you see, had oh, passed really? away. Oh, that's yeah. late. Yeah. Um, I have um, so it's either the first year for him. So when when I went, he neither Barry, yeah, neither Barry nor um, Jerry Andrus were there. Okay, so 2007. Yeah, that's the first. So I was attending them before you. That's really unusual. Yeah. So your first um, year must have been 2007. The sounds about right. The uh, talk was the theme was persuasion, conversion, brainwashing, ethics of behavioral control. Brainwashing, yes. Yeah, and so I started in two. Oh no, I guess I started in 2001, mediumship, something like that. Well, somewhere around there, but it was, it was very close. Yeah, that and, was just, that was just a great thing. Uh, you know, I loved it. And so they've tried to do them at PsyCon and it's like a day event. It's really hard to do because you're missing that. Well, there was a huge amount of stuff that was packed into one weekend and trying to do it all in one day uh, yeah. is, uh, let's just say difficult. And, and you're missing a lot of the flavor of um, of being stuck all together. Yeah, stuck together. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's nice having them all together. They they tried it a couple times at PsyCon. I kind of think of the toolbox as a great place to send somebody who's just getting in for the first time. Yeah. And it's like a here's what you need to have in your toolbox kind of thing, you know. Right. Seriously. And, and uh, as a uh, skepticism as a as a member of the of the board. I can say with reasonable confidence that if we had unlimited funds, we could afford to do these sorts of things. Uh, I, think, but, I think so. It's something I've yeah. argued for for a long time. We, if we could have them in different parts of the country, especially, you know, I mean, if they could go into some of the, the lesser areas where people aren't necessarily able to get to a conference, you know, like right. maybe Louisiana, one in yeah. Mississippi, one in Florida, you know, and, and have them scattered throughout the years. This is something I advocated for for a long time, but you're not. Yeah, and, huge and it's, and it's, it's just hard to do. Different. Yeah, it's, it's expensive. There's a lot of uh, planning and development that needs to be done. And uh, we don't have uh, don't have the resources to do everything we want. Well, now so, we're fine, so maybe we can we can do this ourselves, sort of. Yeah, there's well, it, it's going to be really hard to uh, to duplicate the flavor of coming in for lunch and sitting down next to Ray Hyman. Well, uh, I can get my online. I can go get a cheeseburger and sit here and eat it, and you can get your. <laughs> we could we could sit and eat and talk, and I'm sure people would. I'm sure they'd out. love that. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be quite the same. No, I got to go get another piece of pizza. Anybody want anything while I'm up? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, those are the days. You know, that was uh, fun. It was a great time, and um, I really appreciate that they were so welcoming. And, and for me, as an outsider, that's how I felt. And until I got there, and then I felt like I was loved, and everybody was like, Oh, who are you? And I didn't have a degree, I didn't have, I mean, I had an AA, but I had no scientific background. I was just nobody, you know, just seriously. And then, and but everybody was so wonderful and welcoming and loving, and and um. It was a crash course for me. So anyway, so it's funny that you and I kind of had that same uh, line. What was your, here, here, I have a question for you. Let me go back over to Facebook just to see in case somebody's trying to get a hold of me. Uh, what, what is your, what is your particular, what is your particular thing, you know, that you just cannot let go? Like if you're in a place where you really can't it's awkward, really awkward. And you can't be like, hey, no, that's nonsense. I have, what is your thing that you're like, okay, that's it. You cross I'm not, the I'm not sure there's, there's one that will consistently break through. Uh, I, I just can't, can't tolerate bullshit. <laughs> well, you are, uh, well, you have a degree and you're so articulate and everything. You can get away Well, I, with I do, I do have the degree. I just get emotional and mad. Yeah, I do have the degree. I'm not sure about being articulate, but um, I I have a lot of trouble letting bullshit pass. Uh, whether it be psychics are real or um, 
Trump is uh, trying to take over the world. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. or that he's playing three-dimensional chess. Right. I mean, there's there's lots of stuff uh, that we uh, the the people that uh, uh, I think agree with you and I on most things uh, say that are just total nonsense. And uh, nonsense is nonsense. And as uh, many people have said, truth matters. And when, when people say things that are wrong, uh, I speak up. Not always, because sometimes it's, it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes there's, there's no point. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of the things I've been sort of toying with is trying to start a discussion and because I really don't know the right answer. Uh, when in science communication, lots of times people will just get things wrong. Uh, they get the right answer. Uh, what they're trying to explain is correct. Uh, but the way they're doing it is wrong. So uh, in the, the new coronavirus um, era, uh, there are lots and lots of videos talking about um, why masks are good. And I saw one the other day by a fantastic, uh, was on a really good uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I've seen a fair amount of stuff from that channel and most of it was really quite, quite good. Mm -hmm. And this guy had, uh, was replaying another video that a uh, experimental uh, an, an experimentalist that put together using a really fancy bit of optics called Schlieren photography. And what that? Say uh, Schlieren, and no, I'm not going to spell it. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's something like S C H L I E R I N. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a fantastic technique that allows you to see changes in density of air so it lets you see turbulence and it uh, you can use it for studying aerodynamics and all sorts of stuff uh, noise propagation uh, turbulence so you can see when things are uh, getting chaotic and uh, threatening to to disturb uh, an equilibrium it's really amazing stuff and when you cough or when you breathe or when you talk, the stream of air coming out produces turbulent patterns that are incredibly easily seen with Schlieren photography. And when you put a mask on, all that goes away because it filters out the, um, it, it slows down and spreads out the, uh, uh, the ex the, um, your exhalations. Right. But it has nothing at all to do with droplets of saliva, which is what the coronavirus is spread on. So you have this really compelling video that actually tells you nothing. It looks convincing. It gets the right message across, which is that masks work. But everything factual in it or factual in it is wrong <clears throat> so is that a problem for you obviously <laughs> no but 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 that's not the question no. um i so fine i have problems that's okay everybody <laughs> everybody that knows me knows that later. <laughs> um but it, is that a problem for science for science education yeah, um probably. especially since there are techniques that show the right answer the right way in an equally visual um, approach. And I, I saw one that was absolutely brilliant. I had, would never have thought of it myself. So take a, because everyone has this, take a tray of liquid nitrogen. Oh yeah, 
Oh, I, I misplaced it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You're just well, it's, See the it's cat locked it on the floor or something. It's probably in your storeroom next to your Schlieren photography setup. Oh, I'll, I'll <laughs> check. Because every, everyone's got one of those as well. <laughs> so you, you take a tray of liquid nitrogen. And if you exhale across it, you get a oh, the, the little particles of, of um, water that you emit condense the, uh, the water in the air around them because they've been cooled by the liquid nitrogen. And it lets you see those particles. So what you're seeing is exactly what spreads coronavirus. So it doesn't only look good, it is exactly what you're looking for. And you cough, you breathe, you uh, speak, you sing. And then he did it with different kinds of masks. And you could see that the, the stuff went away. And it was, now it wasn't as well constructed uh, as my son who saw it said the, um, uh, the text looked like it was put in by Adobe Premiere from the 1980s, uh, deliberately to from the people who were reading Adobe in 1980s. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and of course that was before it existed, but that's fine. So it, it wasn't as anywhere near as whiz bang, but it was factually correct. So now if we could uh -huh. just merge the person who did the good test right. with the video with the high quality. And, and I have no idea how to do that. Um, I, of course, don't know everybody and I can't convince everybody to you know, work together. Uh, but if as a community of uh, consumers of information, we would reliably and it somewhat consistently say, hey guys, these things need to be right. You can't just get the right answer. You need to be right all along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, the quality would improve. So we have a question from Wendy. We love Wendy, Wendy Hughes. She went Hello, to Wendy. the smell of cigarette smoke the same. So that's a really interesting question. Um, no. <laughs> so I, uh, those um, are droplets, right? So, well, they're, they're not droplets because they're, they're actually smoke particles, mm -hmm. uh, but they're about the same size. So smoke particles are right around the same size as the, uh, smaller droplets that can spread the coronavirus. And I had a, a panic. Uh, about a month ago, when I realized that if these things are about the same size and they are, you know, can spread through the air, the distance over which you can smell cigarette smoke mm -hmm. is enormous. Yeah, that's true. So what is this six feet nonsense? Mm -hmm. if, if, the, if the particles are the same size, and mass doesn't matter because they're so small, and they spread through the air, then how can six feet be a reasonable thing? And I mentioned this um, to a friend of mine who happens to be a uh, really brilliant PhD chemist. Um, and he said, evaporation. The water droplets evaporate. They don't last very long in the air. Cigarette smoke doesn't. So it can dissipate. So when you exhale, there are two things that happen. One is the heavier droplets drop out of the way and the lighter droplets simply evaporate. They disappear. So it's like cigarette smoke, but different. Okay, so we have another question. Well. Jay Diamond. Hi, Jay. We know and love is has a series of rants here on Facebook. Uh, one of them is uh, Leonard has an issue with people explaining the science of rainbows because they don't take into account quantum mechanics. No, that is not true. <laughs> don't get started. Another thing Jay says there are ex 
explanations and there are Leonard's explanations. See, Jay thinks he's being funny. He doesn't realize I'm going to read these out. <laughs> and uh, last thing he says is on that note, can you ask Leonard about the level, all in caps, right. of science communication needed for the general public? And Wendy says, thank you for your answer. So what You're is welcome. the level of general of science communication needed for the general public? And this is something that I toy with a lot too, as uh, running a Wikipedia editing team, is yep. that I want to I'm more interested in getting enough really good information in a readable way right. onto these pages so people can make pretty good decisions or, yeah. or learn, but not <clears throat> not the details of. So I don't think that there is a single answer to Jay's question because the general public is at all levels. So one of the things that I love to do and haven't been able to do since March is I volunteer at a science center in Oakland and I wind up talking to, so normally it's on Thursday mornings um, and I will not be going there tomorrow. Boo hoo. Um, oh, it's tomorrow Thursday? Tomorrow's Thursday. Well, today's Wednesday, so tomorrow wow. is probably Thursday. Hi, this is a crazy world. Are you ready for trivia? Oh, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. I won't be there. Oh, or oh, you're yeah. going to go to the CFI I'm, thing. I'm, I'm going to do my, I my think CFI. Think just go to the CFI. Bring it. Everybody should come to the trivia. So but anyway, um, so on Thursday mornings, I would in in a past life of BC before COVID. Before COVID, <laughs> I would. Um, I'd go up there and there would be literally hundreds of school kids um, there on a field trip. Mm -hmm. And I would go out of my way to entice them to ask questions. And the, whether it be pre-kindergarten to college, you know, I got students for the, that entire range or the students, the, the parents or the teachers. And you've got to be prepared to answer a question at the level that the person asking it understands the material. And that level is incredibly variable. So you need explanations at all levels. Mm -hmm. You need some that are incredibly simplistic and require absolutely no background. And you require ones that are looking at the nitty gritty details that most people would never notice. But for me, the important thing is not to get anything wrong on any of them. Uh, not to simplify as, as Einstein is apocryphally said to have said, simplify as much as possible, but no more. Don't oversimplify. Don't go to the point where what you're saying is so simple that it, it invites people to think incorrectly about it. And that's hard. Yeah. It's really, really hard. Well, that's why we have science communicators. And some people are better at it than others, especially. And not some all of the people are good communicators. And some of the people that are really good at it are really bad at what I was just talking about. About the details and-, and About getting the right. details right and not um, not getting the, uh, not distorting the facts and oversimplifying. Uh, some, of the, some of the better communicators uh, are not very good, in some cases pretty darn bad at getting things right. Right. Okay, we have another question. This is from Adrian Hill. Hi, Adrian. Up there in Canada. Oh, yeah. Wendy, Wendy Hughes mentions Carl Sagan was extremely good at it. Carl Sagan was wonderful at yeah, both, and his wife. At both oh, of God. the aspects of it. I just listened to her at Nexus and I thought, I, oh. I cried. Anyway, oh, absolutely. So you're getting off subject. Okay, so Adrian Hill says, how do we overcome the lack of expertise of elementary and junior high teachers who are afraid of the subject matter but are expected to teach it? I assume she means like, Evolution, creationism, that kind of stuff. You have you have experts in the field. Do targeted um, uh, programs uh, online or however to uh, to teach them. 
teach them the material and how to teach it. So uh, there is CFI has a um, program now, or is it CSI so, that has it now? Uh, no, it's CF. It's C. It's CFI. It's called TIES, <laughs> the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science or Evolutionary Studies, um, and it is specifically targeted at teaching evolution. Um, it's run by an absolute dynamo, uh, Bertha Vasquez. Mm -hmm. Bertha is wonderful, um, and it started in a uh, in an incredibly wonderful and heartwarming yeah, way. Um, Bertha's a, uh, uh, a teacher in Florida and uh, she went to a, uh, a lecture by Richard Dawkins. Uh, she's interested in evolutionary biology and uh, so of course she went to a lecture by Richard Dawkins. And afterwards she spoke to him and said that, she, that some of her students had questions and uh, wanted to ask and he said, Okay, I, I'm, I'm getting some details wrong, I'm sure, but it was something along the lines of, okay, when can I meet them? So he went was to the, the school. In, was, was the lecture she attending in Florida? Yes. Okay, so he was, was already probably, in Florida. When can I go? Wow. So they arranged it and he went to the school and had a, a discussion and you know, talked to the kids and uh, worked with Bertha to develop the curriculum uh, that has become TIES. And it, it's, just, it's just great. So TIES was part of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, an official program from them. And when uh, RDF and CFI merged uh, a few years ago, uh, we were more than happy uh, to uh, to continue ties because uh, it's great and having programs like ties in other areas um, would be would be wonderful uh, unfortunately and although fortunately in some ways um, evolution is a narrow enough field and it is one that is so desperately in need of improvement in education that it was an obvious target. She says, um, Adrian is saying that uh, she had seen Bertha Vasquez speak at PsyCon, which is great. Uh -huh. And uh, she is she is a great person, uh, really enjoyed meeting her. Um, but Adrian is saying not just evolution, but math and other science topics too, often taught by English or social specialists. You know, sometimes the schools have to have yep. somebody else teaching the class. Um, for whatever reason. I'm also thinking maybe we should mention the Eugenie Scott's, um, uh, they, they, they also, do they also teach people how to talk about science on evolution as well as climate change? You would know more about this than I do. I, I'm so it's sure. the National Council for Science Education. Um, she used which, to run it, not no more. She, she was the founding director. She, she is no longer uh, uh, officially part of that organization. Uh, she has retired. Um, so let, let me back up a bit mm -hmm. um, and sort of tie a couple of threads together. So when I retired, I uh, got involved with something called Project Astro. What is which that? Is Project what? Astro. How, so how would you spell that? A-S-T-R-O. Astro. Astro. Okay. okay. Um, like the, the dog in the Jeff. Oh, yeah, yeah. In the Thin yeah. Men series? Right. Ha, um, I knew that. Yeah. I love the Thin Men series. So the. Um, <laughs> I got to score a point somewhere with somebody, someplace. <laughs> no, I was, I was talking about the Jetsons, the, the animated. The Jetsons. That's the ones. I know that one. Now, now the song's going to be at your word. So the. Um, so I was in a, uh, in a school in Milpitas uh, teaching astronomy to middle school students. Uh, and we were doing a, uh, a lesson on what causes phases of the moon, uh, a subject which is um, amazingly misunderstood by a, a wonderful proportion of, of, uh, of our society. And I thought that I would look in their textbook to 
be able to have you know, the, the page number to tell them to refer to this. Mm -hmm. So I looked in the textbook and found the, uh, the description of what causes phases of the moon. And the pictures were of the seven photographs that they used to show phases of the moon, only one was correct. Oh my goodness. Um, they had other pictures that were upside down or mirror image or upside down and mirror image. Um, so the general shape of the moon was correct in all of them, mm -hmm. but the details were wrong in almost all of them. Aww. So I took the book home. Um, I actually have a copy of it on the shelf behind me. And in a hundred page book, found more than a hundred factual errors. And I had recently retired had more time on my hands than I knew what to do with. Um, and I actually called the publisher and said, I'd like to talk to somebody to see how you can dare publish a book with this many mistakes in it. So they you know, took my name and number and said, we'll call you back in a few days. Hi, Mark. Oh, and nice. um, <laughs> and the um, and of course they didn't call back. Um, I'm going through looking online, found uh, a couple of groups that were already on this problem of factual errors in textbooks. Uh, wound up uh, writing a couple of uh, pieces for their newsletter. Wound up testifying in front of the. California um, Curriculum Commission uh, about errors in, in textbooks like this. And um, trying to get what's, what's right out there has been tricky. Uh, the, the kinds of mistakes that, uh, that are produced are, are just, just amazing. You, you get all sorts of problems. Uh, but having enough background to understand the material is hard. And if you don't get the, the source material right, uh, whether it be textbooks or uh, teacher's aides or, or anything else, um, it's just difficult. And I spent a decade bashing my head against the California Department of Education trying to convince them of the clearly absurd idea that textbooks should be accurate. And I completely failed. I gave up. Um, I, I don't attend those meetings anymore because they, uh, they don't go anywhere. Um, I discussed this uh, with Andy Fracknoy, uh, one of the, uh, the best uh, science communicators around, a, uh, an astronomy professor uh, local to this area. Mm -hmm. And he said, give up before I really even got started. He said, really? you're not going to go anywhere. I know lots of people that have spent years trying to, uh, to do this and they failed miserably. Uh, give up, give up now. Um, and he was right. I should have. Uh, but um, it took me a decade to realize that Andy was right. Give up. Adrian said that she had found glaring errors in math textbooks over the years. And she says she has had the same experience that she never hears back. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, so I, I raised enough of a stink um, at the California Curriculum Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I got involved just as the state of California was going to um, adopt a new set of textbooks. And just as a, um, an example, I grabbed one of the books, went up to a, a resource library in San Mateo, uh, got one of the books that was being considered for adoption, went through a, about 10% of it in pretty fine detail, found a bunch of errors, and submitted them to the, uh, uh, to the curriculum commission and actually got a call from the publisher. Oh, really? And we spent 
four hours, maybe more, on the phone trying to figure out how to correct the errors. Now, there are only about- they would have vetted this way before they had gone to print. You would think so. But they, there's, a, there's a, a whole bunch of things that go wrong along the way. But the funniest thing was there were, there were 60 mistakes that I had documented. So why in the world would 60 mistakes in a junior high level, um, sorry, middle school, that's what it's called now. Yeah, middle school. Uh, uh, in, in a middle school level textbook, take four hours to correct. And the reason was something I had never thought about. Okay. You have to make sure that the correction fits in the same space on the page. Okay. That because if things force a repagination, then when the next uh, printing of the book comes out, it can get mixed in a classroom with the previous printing. So when the teacher says, go to page, blah, blah, it still has to be on the same page. That makes sense. That makes so we sense. spent hours making, oh, you know, okay. getting things to fit, literally, physically fit in exactly the right spot. <clears throat> but you can do it. And if you care about getting it right. Um, so one of the books that I looked at is an astronomy book. Uh, and the main author was a fantastic um, astronomy educator from back east. Uh, and it turns out that he was specifically the guy that Andy Fracknoy was thinking about when he said, I have friends that have tried this and have failed. So there was an error in, uh, in this book on, and the subject was eclipses. This particular astronomer is one of the world's leading authorities on eclipses. I would literally stake my life that that guy could not have made this mistake. It's just impossible. Um, and I sent him an email uh, saying, I found this. What do you think? Half an hour later, my phone rings. I had not given him my phone number. Oh, well, he's... My phone rings. Uh -huh. He calls me and says, you have a copy of the book? <laughs> That's great. They want me to approve it for publication, and I haven't seen it yet. And we talked about this error, and I talked to one of the editors at the, at the uh, publisher and found out how the mistake got in there. Because, of course, this professor had never written that. So they're, they're laying out the book. They come to the end of the chapter on eclipses. And they had empty space on the page. So the editor went back and found something close to the topic that was being discussed from another version of the book, another uh, series took a paragraph that had been poorly written, so it was ambiguous, and clarified it to make it completely wrong. So it was no longer ambiguous, it was simply incorrect, and stuck it in. No subject matter expert had seen it. It was in a previous book, so it must be right. The uh, change that he made seemed right to him. He was just clearing up the, uh, the bad wording. And it went through everything until I found it and fixed it. Oh my gosh. In, uh, Wendy makes a good point. She says that, you know, now it seems like with there's customized typesetting, she says it's, that can adjust space is called kerning, K-E-R. Oh no, this, it, this, is, this is much more um, dramatic than can be uh, fixed by kerning. I'm talking about adding an entire sentence. Too much, too much content. So, just, you know, I'm, I'm wondering- Just that, too much space. Is this just one more reason that maybe we should drop books, printed books, and go to something that can be easily fixed? Or, I mean, you know, kids- It, it, it is a- They're heavy, huge. I mean, the backpacks these kids are carrying around with them with all the books they have, it's just- Yeah, 
Um, and, and now, that's that's COVID, because they don't have. We know not to be touching stuff, and books are well, maybe not a good idea to have anymore around that are schools for schools. Well, um, there was a time back in the ancient past, just after the dinosaurs, <laughs> when we had lockers in schools, and you didn't have to lug your books around. Yeah, but you got to get them to school. And well, no, the, you got to go take them home with you when you got to do your homework. I know uh, my kids had massive backpacks with all this heavy stuff. I, I went to school. I like, didn't have. They're like all hunched like this. Well, that was back in the old days, Leonard. I'm talking about in the. In the right. But, the, but there are some things about the old days that are good. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, so it's, I it's not it clear. But the point yeah. is, is that should should we make a second thought of going to computers? I mean, you know, everything's oh. online. Also, because, well, like now these kids are home learning, maybe they wouldn't have to deal with that, you know? There's, there's no question that the, the issues of accuracy are more easily addressed um, if things are online. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, the pressures to correct things and make them wrong uh, would also be strong. And you're going to have, you know, take evolution, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a perfectly accurate, wonderful uh, piece of highly vetted science communication it goes out to the schools and the, uh, and the local pastor um, complains runs up a, uh, uh, a huge campaign to, to get it changed. That's a whole nother story. And I, I should mention that Rob Palmer is having a fit every time we mention after the dinosaurs, he's about to have an epileptic fit. Why? Because he says we still have dinosaurs amongst us because they're birds and stuff. Uh, dinosaur is short for non-avian dinosaur. See, Rob? So uh, hanging it, with the smart dude now. We're we're just uh, <laughs> uh, we're just abbreviating the phrase. So I have two more questions here that I got to ask you. Let me get to them. Um, the first one is from. Let me move it onto one of my screens. Gosh, I don't know how I functioned before I had two screens. First one is from Janine Denoma. Hi, Janine. Uh, love up there in Oregon. Yep. Met her at the Skeptic Toolbox. All, yeah, Skeptic Toolbox. She keeps them all organized. She's the keeper of the Jerry Andrus stuff. Yep. And she also has the most amazing blackberries. I'm not, <laughs> blackberry I not tried her blackberries. I've been in her house a couple times. She's amazing. Anyway, I'm uh, I'm leaning forward to take a look at some of the of the uh, uh, blackberries. No, the questions on Facebook. Oh no, you're not. I, I'm not supposed to look, but I do have two screens. Okay. How do um, we make an effort to get ahead of the emerging pseudoscience? I'm thinking of the talk at SciCon that about using inoculation information. I can't remember the speaker right off my head. Uh, I think the speaker had worked on climate change with NCSE. Is this technique something that skeptics could put to more effective use? And I think she's talking about Glenn Branch, who talked about the flat earth if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it wasn't Glenn Branch. I don't no, I think Glenn's I talk was for Skeptical. Yeah, that was Skeptical. Yeah. So I'm not sure which she's talking about, but she's talking about this idea of inoculation, which I totally agree with. Uh, right. You know, getting some, getting people inoculated about critical thinking. I mean, we don't know what the next pseudoscience is necessarily going to be. So let's just talk about it and how to evaluate claims, which is, again, what we kind of learned at, tool, at the toolbox. Yeah. Uh, a consistent introduction and um, teaching of critical thinking, mm -hmm. starting in primary school, yes, and just getting more sophisticated and more explicit as we go on, would be a wonderful addition to education. Um, I think that's the way to do it. Um, I am not an expert in pedagogy. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think anybody actually is. Uh, when we look at uh, the, the way things are taught, it's, uh, it's rather haphazard. Um, 
So one of the things that I did as uh, in, in my copious spare time, um, I um, signed up with the National Science Foundation Mm-hmm. to be a, uh, an evaluator of a bunch of proposals that had been sent in. Oh. Um, so I spent several months going over uh, a bunch of, of proposals that had been sent in. And then a thousand of us, a couple wow. of hundred, I don't remember, it was a huge number, all met in D.C., D.C., um, and got together uh, in groups to evaluate these programs. And the night before all this started, we all met in a big ballroom and they gave us a presentation um, because they were very proud of the fact that they had finally done a detailed scientific investigation of what is the best way to teach people to read. And you seem to have frozen. No, you're there. No, I'm not frozen. I'm yeah. just waiting. <laughs> yeah. And the. Uh, I'm dying to hear what you're going to have to say on this. Okay. So how to teach people to read. And it particularly warmed my heart because they said that they had specifically um, enlisted physicists to do the data analysis because they were really good at extracting tiny signals from a large amount of background noise, which was exactly the problem they had here. So after, I don't remember how long it was, somewhere on the order of a decade, they had developed a testing procedure and evaluation criteria, and they had looked at how it is you're supposed to, you know, what is the best available method for teaching people to read? And the answer was phonics the way I was taught back in the 1950s. And um, this was, you know, released to lots of fanfare. It was great. Everybody was happy. But we were there to evaluate math and science stuff. And the math and science stuff had not gone through a similar process. So they didn't know exactly what the best ways to teach it was. So what techniques were they advocating? The ones that paralleled almost perfectly, the ones that were shown not to work. So I'm sitting in this audience with hundreds of science experts that were passionately interested in education. And we're going, what, 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 what are they saying? Why would you do this? So they, they knew that these programs, these processes don't work in reading. They know what does work in reading. But let's ignore all that. And as far as I know, and I have not kept careful track, but sort of peripherally been involved, um, no research like was done in reading has been done on any other subject. And we still have this same nonsense. So one of the things that you'll, you'll hear frequently in discussions of education is um, I'm a visual learner or I'm an auditory learner or whatever, learning styles. Every scientific evaluation of this idea has shown it to be bunk. Yes, learning styles exist. It's more important to tune what learning style you use to the subject material than it is to tune it to the individual students. That works better. Every time it's been evaluated, that works better. But the colleges of education still teach learning styles as if it's the more important to tune it to the students than to the material. We know what's right. We've done the science. And in case you can't tell, it pisses me off. (laughs) This is you pissed off. Yeah, this is me pissed off. Okay, I got another question. We've got some questions. This is good, people are listening. It's Jay Diamond again. 
Not Jay. Yep. He's a smart guy. All right. As a board member for the largest international skeptic organization, can you talk about what organizations like CFI can do that local skeptic groups can't? Where do you think local groups should spend their efforts for maximum impact? So those are those are two very different questions. Okay. Um, what CFI can do that local groups can't um, are some of the things that we do. Uh, we lobby uh, both at the national and international level. Uh, CFI has a presence um, at the UN. Um, we have a uh, um, we're, we're part of an organization that lobbies the U.S. federal government. Uh, and these are things that local organizations simply can't do, um, not, not easily at least. Um, local organizations, uh, it's gonna depend on the local. Uh, what, what the right thing to do is gonna be very different for different areas. But I think that one of the most important things and one of the things I miss most during this um, expletive deleted pandemic is the social stuff, getting yeah. together with people that think like you do, not because I wanna be in a silo, but because I wanna be uncomfortable. Um, uh, so I, Susan doesn't live far from me, but uh, the, the area that I live in is a bubble within a bubble. Yes, it is. I mean, it's ridiculous. I live a stone's throw from Stanford University, mm -hmm. uh, which although it is a fairly conservative university for universities, it's still a pretty liberal place. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of people that, that you know, think about things in, in a way that is consistent with science. But there's still an awful lot of woo and silliness that goes on. Not, not that much. I don't I'm sure there, there is, but it's there not is. I mean, we're talking about um, uh, palm reading and you know psychics. They're they're still around. Yeah, and just and yeah. you know and silliness like homeopathy in the drugstores. I mean that that's still yeah thing that local groups can't do anything about. But CFI sued Walmart and CVS uh, for uh, selling homeopathic materials um, in their drugstores. On stores. the medicine aisle in the medicine yeah. area. Um, so I, I had the, the wonderful opportunity to go on a cruise, uh, sponsored by CFI, mm -hmm. uh, to the Amazon. And I remember sitting on the top deck of the boat, uh, with Steven Pinker, um, <laughs> and suddenly realizing that it had been three or four days since I had had to censor anything I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Just the, the complete freedom to express yourself uh, was just wonderful. And yeah, it's, it's certainly not crippling around here, but our monthly meetings or a couple of times a month meetings where you get together with skeptics groups in the area uh, is really good and I really miss it. I know exactly what you mean. I had Mark and I met a man recently um, and he was seemed like a sciencey kind of guy. And then he started talking about um, CBC, CBC oil, what is it called? CBD. CBD oil from marijuana yeah. plants, yeah. I guess. And he was talking about how it fixed his, he was talking about how it fixed the back of his daughter's back. And, and I'm like, hmm. Hey, we're not on the same subject here. So I'm, I'm up at Chabot yeah. um, waiting to go, get into a, um, uh, an enrichment lecture for the volunteers. And I'm talking to one of the other volunteers about how often we get people that come to Chabot to, um, that dismiss it on the moon, moon landing deniers. And it happens. Right. And we're you know, commiserating about talking to people like this. And we're going, and I'm you know, going off on, you know, oh, all these other nonsense. Turns out she is a Reiki master. 
Yes, that was exactly my reaction. I just, I had, how? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, I remember <laughs> taking my, <laughs> we're going to tell stories now, I, but I got one. Um, I remember when I was getting my BA, it was 2002, and I had to do in-service learning. I had, I had to work volunteer at a middle school. And they had this woman who was probably 15 years younger than me, who was the teacher who was, well, who was in charge of, of my, you know, signing off on everything. And she, she had these after school programs that were for kids at this middle school. They were really great. You know, we cut up squids and we looked at eyeballs and we did, you know, all kinds of science. All the fun stuff. stuff. Yeah, it was great. It was really great. It was like a science class I hadn't really had. It was, it was, it was instructive and I enjoyed it a lot. And as we were walking out one day, she said something about a telephone pole nearby that it was causing cancer to people. And I was like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, telephone poles don't cause cancer. And she's like, well, yeah, they do. And I said, uh, why didn't you look on, I, I think that if we looked at the American um, Cancer Society's webpage, I bet you they would have a statement about that because I don't think that's a thing. She goes, well, you just don't know. She got really defensive. And I was trying to be very calm and we were like leaving. And I thought this is years, 2002, but right. it, it was, oh, well, look at all these. All right, you guys stop. I can't, I can't see them all. Um, I can't see all the comments. They're gone now because the comments I was going to read next are gone because these people. I can, I can see a whole bunch. And Leonard is writing here too. Yeah, I need to see this this moon exhibit. I've seen it in a video that you well, I didn't it's, see it. Uh, it's I saw gone. It on the, I saw you did a uh, with uh, Richard Saunders on the yes, Zone. Yes, that was that was fun. I was loving it, and I said I've got to look this up. And I looked it up online. And I said I've got to get there. It's only a couple hours for me. I can't believe I've all these things. I said I would do later. Now, yeah, no that that exhibit is gone. That was a that was a temporary exhibit. Really a shame. Really a shame. If anybody has something they wanted me to ask Leonard and I didn't ask it that was important, you better put it back into the comments because I was engaged with whatever Leonard was saying at that moment. So um, listening to the discussions about facilitated communication um, yes, the last couple of days that. reminded me of, of, uh, of something. Okay. Janice, you listening? I don't think Janice is listening at this moment. Uh, you, you can, help, you can uh, let her know. So... After SciCon in New Orleans, which um, you didn't um, go to, you didn't go. No, I was I was not part of the group then. I was. You were you were not you were not involved yet. No money. Yeah. So um, I'm on the plane coming home, and the woman next to me um, asks, you know, where I'm going and where I was and all that stuff, and we're talking about things. And I forget exactly how it came up, but it turns out that she had a severely handicapped daughter who was in her 20s, who um, through facilitated communication, uh, it was discovered that this person was a literary genius and was um, you know, writing books of poetry. How do you tell someone in that situation that facilitated communications is bullshit? Yeah, especially since they bought into it. It's not that she had completely bought into it. Yeah. If can. I had convinced her that it was wrong, it would be like her losing her daughter again. Absolutely. Janice and I talk about this all the time. We'll say, you know, there's there's an element of people we're never going to be able to touch, and we probably even may not even should. Bother yeah, may not even want to. Because so I, I, it's not gonna. But what you're, we're trying to do is stop it before it gets to be right a technique. And, and so what I, I so what I said to her was, you realize that that technique has not been shown to be effective, mm -hmm. and she said, "Oh yeah, I know that." But it works on my daughter. And I had no choice. I stopped. I, I could not continue. There's just no way. Um, and I 
simultaneously was glad that I did and felt terrible that I did. Yeah, well, you have to sit in the plane with her for... <laughs> yeah. No, oh, fortunately, I... that was just the... It was from... Be very uncomfortable. It was New Orleans to Denver. She got off in Denver and I came home to San Francisco. But, oh, what a... It's just terrible. And the... Uh, the the vampire like um, approach of just sucking the uh, the money out of people to give them this false um, joy is uh, disturbing. Yeah, it's just like psychics. You know, the more I get into this, the more I've seen it. It feels just like being with psychics, and that's what Mark Edward was kind of explaining yesterday in the lecture. Yep. It's it, it and Janice has said the same thing. She says that. The more she understands about the psychic world, the more she sees how it overlaps with the facilitated communication world and, and the not only the way they think, but you know, eating a motor effect and, and speaking to your dead child is either your dead child or a child that you're facilitating is, you know, kind of in the same right. way. And they, you know? they all take advantage of the same cognitive biases and heuristics we um, that yeah. we all have. And whether it's belief in Bigfoot or being fooled by a psychic, um, it's the same as Jade Diamond would love to say, silly, fallible humans um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that get us in trouble. So, so let me ask you this, and I, I assume we're going to have the same answer. <laughs> uh, from time to time, we're criticized for what some people call Bigfoot skepticism which I'm, I'm okay with that term, I'll take uh -huh. it. But uh, they say, you know, why are we wasting our time with flat earth and crystals and, you know, homeopathic stuff and when and, there's and really Bigfoot. serious stuff out there like fill in the blank, you know, religion or um, uh, climate change or, you know, serious, serious stuff, nuclear weapons, I don't know. They, whatever fill in the blank of whatever they think is the most important thing we should be addressing and here we are working on psychics Co COVID, still, still yeah. hanging fruit, uh, the idea that, that heard, COVID is caused by 5g oh yeah well yeah. so why should we care is is why why are we wasting our time and our energy on stuff like that so my answer i won't tell I you my answer yeah, my <laughs> answer which i think is your answer okay is channel me here I'm at here. some just a sec okay got it Okay. Um, at, at some level, all of these things are the same. And if you find a subject that isn't emotionally charged, and you can explain the process by which we get fooled, mm -hmm. and people can understand it under those circumstances, then people will uh, much more readily accept these ideas. So you can use Bigfoot or Flat Earth as a, uh, as a teaching tool and a, an explanation that allows people to, without having the emotional feedback, because they all go, Flat Earth, no one believes that nonsense. Um, well, but we people do. The moon. <laughs> right, the moon landing. Um, so by having things that are not so current, not so emotionally charged, um, not so uh, much of a hot button item, you can teach what's actually going on uh, without triggering the, uh, um, the feedback mechanisms that, that make it hard for people to learn. Right. It's, it's Is that your vocabulary. answer? Well, yeah. It's it's a vocabulary you're having with them. You're you're uh, it's some and this is Brian Dunning talks about this a lot whenever he's asked this question. So I'm I'm cribbing him that uh, we don't necessarily speak the same language as some people. You know, right. the idea of theory, energy, um, evidence they don't necessarily mean the same to right in different groups. But if you do go with something like you said that's not emotionally charged, flat Earth, Bigfoot, crystals, or whatever then you can at least have a discussion with them and come to some agreement on what the words mean. Right. So that whenever we have a discussion about something a little more serious, 
then we have a common vocabulary and the idea of what is evidence for some low hanging fruit thing like Bigfoot might be the way of getting in to discuss what is evidence for something a little more um, up on the chain of, of importance. Right. But I'd also say that one of the reasons why I'm so interested, I, I'm okay with the term Bigfoot skepticism is because I really enjoy it. And I don't think <laughs> that, you know, I think that if that is your passion, if um, cryptids are your passion, I think that go for it. I don't, who am I to say, oh no, I don't think you should be talking about the Loch Ness monster. I think you should be working on homeopathy because that's a bigger, you know, that's a medical thing that could actually hurt somebody or keep people from getting medical advice or whatever. It's like, it's, it's, that's not my, that's not my business. I'm not in charge of the world. Nobody voted for me. And I think that we should do what we feel passionate about, try to learn everything you can about it and do it well and be exact as you would say. And I think that in a roundabout way, especially like you said, a lot of these at the, at the at its basics are pretty similar. Right. And if you have, um, I know that the overlap, I, I've heard a lot of, uh, I have heard that long, young earth creationists still believe that uh, the Loch Ness Monster existed and a lot of these other cryptids and other kinds of things. And so, so if they're teaching this to their their students or the people in the schools, I mean, people who are young and they're saying, oh, well, you know, uh, dinosaurs in the earth were actually this and they were planted by God to test us or whatever. Um, and Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot are actually examples of how we know that the earth is only 6,000 years old or whatever. And then when that child grows up enough and learns about the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, I think what's going to happen is they're going to go, that's what I was taught? This is bullshit. What else have I been taught? That, and is obviously bullshit. Because my parents were really, really into this Noah being swallowed by the whale. And they really believed that. And so Jonah. now that I know that this is stupid... You know, maybe I should look at some of the other claims my parents made with a straight face as well. Yeah, I uh, I, I had one of those. <laughs> I, I had one of those. Well, yeah, um, I think you do, don't you? Yeah, um, I uh, I was in my older son's fourth grade classroom uh, for an open house, mm -hmm. and there was a skeleton on display. And I said to the teacher, who was actually a, a cousin. Um, oh, that's a female skeleton. And he said, how do you know? And I said, because it has an even number of ribs. <gasps> oh, I had, been, I had been told when I was, you know, 12, yeah. um, that She's missing a rib. men have an, even, an odd number of ribs and women have an even number of ribs. Oh, yeah. That wa rib. wasn't because God took a rib from uh, from Adam, it was the story was based on that fact. So I was taught in a fairly progressive, non-literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, I didn't believe any of the, of the God stuff, that none of that ever made sense to me. But the idea that men have an even number, an odd number of ribs and women have an even number of ribs, that was, you know, I, I'd never seen a skeleton. Um, I remember poking at my chest and trying to count ribs and coming up with an, an even number. Um, and I just thought there was one tucked behind that I couldn't get to or something. Um, so I had been taught that and it was dead wrong. And when I found that out in my you know 30s, uh, I was pretty pissed. Um, being being a conduit of inaccurate information uh, should annoy you. And it clearly annoys me that it, more than it annoys most people. Uh, but I suspect that most people don't like to be wrong. So, so I've got a few here. I've gotten smart and I'm copying them here. Um, Janine, Janine Denoma, she says, Bigfoot skepticism is where kids start. Uh -huh. They are the mysteries that kids love, and it's the best place to start teaching critical thinking. And that was my experience as a mother of a 10-year-old. I needed to learn 
when my son was little, how to answer his questions. I have skepticism to think for teaching me how to help him learn how to think about things, but that's a good good answer. I think that's, that's good. Yep. You know, as I as you and I both said, we were attracted to skeptical inquire. Someday we ran across it. I remember seeing the cover and thinking, oh, that looks interesting. And I don't know if it was vampires or or what it was. It might have been a cryptozoolog cryptozoological creature. But that drew me in and look at me now. So and um, Deborah Warkin, she says, some things are important enough that we should tackle them even when they are emotion t triggers for people. And that is another thing that I've learned from Brian Dunning. Um, is that no some question things, about that. Some things are things you need to deal with now and take care of. And some things are you play the long game and you work on them over time, depending on, I guess, what it is and how much time you have with them and how much influence you have over them. I suspect that it winds up that everything needs to be worked on over time because we wind up playing whack-a-mole and ideas are, as someone has said, unsinkable rubber duckies. Yeah, well, so, so okay. So today I was telling Leonard before we got on the call that I had a friend of mine had a COVID scare, uh, somebody that you guys don't know. And she, she was telling me how she heard a husband allowed somebody into their house to do some work on the house for a couple of days. Nobody was masked. And there's a lot of vulnerable people in the household. And um, the guy found out he had COVID a couple of days afterwards. And, you know, that was a bit of a scare. They're all tested and they're all, everybody's fine now. But I had a bit of a yell. I mean, absolutely <laughs> yell at her for how stupid could you possibly be? That is the most stupidest thing I've ever heard. I, 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 how could you possibly have done something so dumb and just to save some money, you had this guy in who's a friend of somebody's and nobody wore masks because of, I was just furious at her. And so that is the kind of thing I think should be dealt with now, today. We're not going to have, you know, it's not like she's like, well, I think I might try crystals or pyramid power or something like that and be like well you know i'm not so sure that's a great idea but you know if you want to try laying under a crystal or a pyramid okay but pyramids that's that a long game but somebody who's who's wandering around without a mask letting them in your house for hours at a time with other unmasked people yep. is not okay let's play the long game discussion yeah <laughs> so um, yeah there's a variety i think of <laughs> yeah deborah says we also have to work on our approach to people and i think that's something the skept skeptics really should i i'd like to see it uh, at the toolbox or where if they had something like that again just how to talk to people how to not come out arrogant and like an asshole and and making yourself angry as phil plate once said don't, don't be a dick, dick. unless they're about to let somebody in their house without a mask. <laughs> yes, but you can still be nice about it. No, I know. I I, I, so. Well, if it works, there, there are going to be situations It where depends on your relationship with that person too. And it depends case, on your relationship and her. how they react. Right, this is, this is a case that she was extremely embarrassed to even tell me because she, she waited to tell me until after everybody had tested negative. Right. And many days have passed, it's been over, or a little over a week, but it was just like, yeah, it's a problem. It's definitely a problem. Yeah, having these conversations. Paulinda says, if you think the Earth is six thousand years old, you won't be convinced the Loch Ness monster is a pleosaur is not possible because they died out millions of years before the locks were created. Oh, she's sciencing that. That just doesn't. Yeah, happen. there's there there are problems with. Uh, uh, with people having fundamental ideas that are simply wrong. Uh, so I'm at Chabot one day mm -hmm. and I'm standing in the uh, introductory exhibit, which at the time had a scale model of the solar system built into the floor. And I'm talking to this woman and we're standing just inside of the orbit of Pluto which at the time was still considered a planet. And she wanted to know where the furthest star 
was on this model. Okay. Uh, and she pointed to where she was standing and said, is it about here? Remember, we're standing inside the orbit of Pluto. Okay. And I said, no, the closest star on this scale would be on the other side of the country. And she went, no, that can't be. Maybe it's just here. And she points a little closer to Pluto. And a couple of exchanges. And I realized that somewhere along the line, she had either been told or she misheard that Pluto was the furthest thing. Not the furthest planet in our solar system, but the furthest object in the universe. In the universe? Yes. Not she the solar came system. in, not the solar the system, the universe. She came in with that thought. And it took several iterations of these things are further, and this is how we know they're further for her to accept this. But when she did, her universe just grew enormously. So she watching was to accept the, the expression okay. on her okay. face was, whoa, <laughs> space is big. She had an um, aha moment. Those are oh, it was a spectacular aha moment. But it took it took a few minutes to carefully unwind mm -hmm. the uh, misconception she had in her mind. And usually you don't have the opportunity um, and sometimes don't have the knowledge expertise to, to know where to go. Uh, and it's hard. But if someone thinks the universe is six, the, the world it was created 6,000, years ago, well, maybe the whole universe. Um, that's going to be something that takes some untying. Yeah, you have to start probably small, again, coming up with the same, find a way of communicating with each other without yelling and having the same right. vocabulary meaning the same thing, because... So there was, in, this, in the same iteration of that exhibit at Chabot, they had a scale model showing the uh, diameters of all of the planets. Um, from Mercury is the smallest to Jupiter is the largest. And something struck me looking at this. Um, Earth and Venus are almost the same size. Uranus and Neptune are almost the same size. Jupiter and Saturn are almost the same size. So of the then nine or eight planets, Six of them come in pairs. Why? Why do planet sizes tend to bunch? Okay, are you asking me? No, this, this, is, this is a question oh, that popped okay. into my mind. Okay. And the answer is, is known and it's understood and it's goddamn complicated. Um, okay. I, I was gonna say that it's, it's a little too complicated for me to explain here. But you think, <laughs> thank you, Susan. <laughs> it is important to keep your audience in mind. But I ask this to, uh, to visitors to get their mind thinking and to see what they, what they think. And I got an answer one day that I had no idea how to handle. And the answer was, God made it that way. Boy, that's a limiting... Don't you feel sorry for somebody like that? So that how, how, do you, always, how do you respond I to that? So I eventually figured it out, but long after this visitor had left, said, okay, because I, I got the same answer I, I guess a year I would or two say, later. Which God? No, no, no. You can't challenge it. I know, but that's what. Yeah, no, as, as a. Oh, as which a, God are you talking about? As a public Zeus? facing um, yeah, person, I think I athlete, you, you can't do that. So I said, all right, let's ignore that for the moment. Mm -hmm we've been able to learn a lot about the universe by observing it. What is the universe? What has God put into the universe to teach us about the way things work? And let the idea of science as a way to understand things 
percolate through. So with the 6,000 year old earth, discuss things that take a long time, clocks that we have, radioactive decay, and the, the huge scaffold of information, all of which leads to the same conclusion that the earth is four and a half billion years old and the universe is 13.8 billion. Um, Approximately. Roughly. I'm only giving it's it to a, a few, only giving it to a few significant pivots. It's a Tuesday. Um, it was, uh, I forget what day of the week it was. It was, I thought uh, it was Tuesday. Uh, it was October 23rd, 4004 BC at 9 a.m. I thought it was 2.34 p.m. Uh, no, it was, it, was, it was on an even hour, but uh, someone, I remember someone telling me this, and I forgot to ask them what time zone. I think, <laughs> I think docking, Dockings, oh no, Stephen Fry asked that question. Is it Stephen Fry? He asked, room, no, no, Q, what's his name? John Delancey. John Delancey. He's had, he's gone and, and talked to give him lectures and he, he's asked people. What time zone? Classroom, he'll say, how many people here believe that the earth was created on, and he has a day and a time. Yeah, and October 23rd, 4004 BC. Yeah, so there's, there is a date in the floating in the Christian world date. Yeah, time. That, that's the one. <laughs> I don't know. It's, what it's, it's mentioned in, um, uh, I think it's mentioned in uh, Darwin's Origin of Species. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah, it goes, it, it's, it's been around for a while. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Someone should fact check me. Let me That's fact good. check him quick. Yeah. So Paula, Paulinda says that, oh yeah. Oh, Jason Bush says, when you said that the, her, the, her eyes opened and, and it just expanded, her universe got bigger and he said- It sure did. It was, said, ah, it was ah, wonderful ah. to watch. And Paulinda says, I'm afraid many believers will just answer back that God is mysterious or will something that, and that's good enough and won't venture past that, which like I said, I think is- really Some sad. will. That's really sad. I, I'm sad- So I, I run into people like that and I, and I can get past that by gently pointing out that we have advanced in our knowledge using science. And that if the universe was created by this omnip on omniscient and omnipotent being with, and we have our abilities to do this, it would be a waste not to use them. That's a nice way of saying it. That's so cool. let's, let's continue a process that has worked and has been beneficial to so many people for so long and not just end the discussion there, because that would be the end of progress. And I not run into anyone that that hasn't worked on. I suspect that there are people that it won't work on. And if I run into one of those, when the world opens up again, um, I will try and figure out a way to get past that. And if I fail, then I will. You well, you gotta that. keep trying. Absolutely, we have to keep trying. Yep. So we're we're almost on. Would you believe two hours? Can you believe it? Ah. The time goes whenever I do these interviews. People go, "Oh, we'll talk for an hour," and I'm like, "An hour is just barely long enough to introduce yourself and answer a couple <laughs> questions." It just goes by really fast when you're having a really interesting conversation with people you like. It's yeah. It, it just goes. So, um, but we probably should end. Um, yeah. Because this close to two hours and thank you all for for hanging out with us yeah um, I'll, 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 I'll uh let me go announce for a hike somewhere up, what's coming up and then you can have any parting parting remarks that you want to give to the to the or if anyone's world. got a, a, a question that's just been burning who if, if anyone has oh yeah if you have a question get it in really really quick um so i want to make announcements just because i can please subscribe to us on about time um about Time uh, uh, Project on YouTube, as well as on Facebook. If you want to be notified of talks that are coming up, and we have a lot of them, you can go to About Time, uh, uh, their Facebook page, and you can turn on your notifications so that anytime that Susan Gerbic or About Time 
uh, is online, you will get a quick notification that I'm already online, but we do put out events. Paulinda has been very good at doing that. And you, Paulinda. You go to, yeah, she's great. If you go to, we don't want her to go back to work. She's working from home <laughs> right now. So, um, so she has time to do this kind of stuff. And we also have a YouTube channel called About Time um, Project. And if you subscribe to that, you can see every time we upload a new video. And I've just been given a notification that one of our videos is the one I did yesterday with Mark Edward and Janice Poyton is now live. I just need to go review it and make it public instead of private. These are also still remain here on Facebook for people to, to enjoy. We are a nonprofit. If you'd like to help us out that way, that'd be fine. We would appreciate that. And um, Upcoming tonight at 6.30 California time, Janice Boynton and I will be talking to Michael Burke, who is a, um, he was a reporter at a University of Syracuse. And what he did as a student there is he took on facilitated communication, which is what they have an institute there. And he wrote a couple really amazing articles about facilitated communication. There was a lot of pressure being a student reporter at writing for a student paper, um, um, going against a lot of the faculty. And um, it was it was interesting. So we were gonna pick his brain. He's now graduated and he's moved on with his life doing other things, but we're gonna talk to him about those times when he was writing these Wikipedia pages. I mean, these articles that we put on the Wikipedia page. And if you wanna know more about that, you can tune in or you can watch our interview later on YouTube. Also on the facilitated communication Wikipedia page, if you look for the Daily Orange, which is the name of the student newspaper at Syracuse. You could find those articles. I reread them today. And tomorrow, which is Thursday, so I'm told, uh, the UK skeptics first off have a talk in, it comes, it's 11 o'clock our time. They have a skeptics in the pub every, every, every Thursday. And also Center for Inquiry will be having a uh, lecture. It will be three o'clock my time. Uh, you guys all have to check this out and you can, you can register for, for the different talks. For Center for Inquiry, it's called Skeptical Inquirer Presents and you have to register, it's free and they send you a link and then you can watch. And um, the very funny lady, um, Leanne Lord, and that's her moniker is the funny lady, I think, right? The very funny lady, very which she funny says lady. is an aspirational title. Yeah, she, she really is funny. She's, uh, she's great. She's hosting and she does a fantastic job. Um, I can't remember who she's interviewing tomorrow, but I'm sure it'll be good because they are all going to be good. It's basically what Center for, uh, CSI is doing is they're interviewing a lot of the people who would have been doing talks at PSYCON if it was to be happening this year. So um, that's a lot of the people they'll be interviewing. Um, Squaring the Strange podcast will be releasing their newest episode tomorrow, which is going to feature moi. I will be talking about psychics. And at 6.30, if you want to join us for trivia on Zoom, we do that. And Leonard sadly will not be there, but he's been there almost every one of them. There's so much fun. Trivia. I run a trivia game. And then um, that's all I have on my on my calendar right now. I have other things that are going to be coming up. Um, I do see that Center for Inquiry, uh, Skeptical Inquiry Presents is going to, on the 13th, is going to have a talk with uh, Paul Offit, which is obviously, always amazing. Um, I interviewed him for About Time Presents. You'll find him on the website, on our YouTube channel. I got 30 minutes with him and I just, I didn't even introduce him. I'm like, this is Paul Offit, everybody. Question one, <laughs> question two, question three. If you guys want to know who Paul Offit is, do it Look on your own up. time. I got 30 minutes of this guy. I'm not going to spend any time introducing him. Um, oh, the next CSI talk, Janine says, I thought that was on the 13th. What's happening tomorrow? Is there a talk tomorrow? I don't know. Because I know they skipped one. They skipped, they, they said we're going to do them every two weeks. Oh, you're right. There isn't one tomorrow. Every two weeks they're doing it. So I feel stupid. Okay, so the next talk is on the 13th, which is the following Thursday. And Jason Bush says he really appreciates you two in my life, Leonard and Susan. Thanks for doing this. Uh, don't you love these people? Right, right back at you, Jason. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. You know, I don't I don't see my family or anybody very much uh, at all anymore, but I, I get to hang out with you guys and I love this technology. Yeah, it's fun. Janine. 
the technology makes it available for us to be able to have these these conversations. But anyway, so my point is, there's a lot of things to do online uh, to keep yourself sane and educated. And if you have other people you think that I should be interviewing, please let me know. Um, you know, I've got some time and um, we're always doing something interesting here in Susan Gervickville. Um, Mark calls my, this office is called the war room. <laughs> That's a, a pretty pleasant looking war room. Yeah, it is kind of nice, but it's full of books. All around me is books and um, I can look at it. Art and I have photographs of a lot of people, all different conferences I have attended, people I've met. I've just got them in frames all over in here and I've got a wall of photos over here. You can't see it, but I, I, I love photographs and I love to be able to just glance up and see something new. I have lots of mementos of things around me. I have a chupacabra little thing right here and and something I met, I got when I went to go see Lee Pinter in Arkansas and all kinds of little knickknacks. And this is from Wales when I was hanging out with skeptics. Of it. I have lots of things that I can look at. A Pegasus from Richard Saunders. Anyway, oh. so, so your final imparting wisdom. Look, this, no is, this, has no been, uh, this has been really lovely. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, I... I was dreading the possibility of, of having to live up to people like Paul Offit, uh, but having interesting questions from you uh, made up for, uh, for anything that... It's fun. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah, I, you know, first I wanted to do lectures and now I'm like, no, I want to have conversations because yeah. the people are so interesting and I don't want to ask you questions people are always asking me. Anyway, thank you so much, Leonard. I really appreciate You're welcome. You taking this time, two hours out of your day to come and talk to me. Wow, it's crazy. Crazy yeah. talk. Two hours, wow. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, go for a hike in the Baylands, I think, and take some pictures of birds. I should work in the garden, but I've got to go get some tea and if somebody's growing. <laughs> Bye, all. Alrighty, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.